what is the risk that, that a program like Dream Chaser would, would lose some of the scheduled uh, funding going forward? And, and maybe if you can talk about how the process shakes out. I can't talk about the competition because we're in blackout in terms of the selection of uh, the company or companies that are going to provide commercial crew. But in terms of what Sierra Nevada is doing, they're still working uh, under contract to us to fulfill milestones under a couple of other segments of the development program for commercial crew. We have spent years working with, with the industry to determine what are going to be the standards for human rating, what are going to be the engineering standards for equipment, and we've reached a compromise that says if your standard, your company's standard, or the one you follow traditionally is higher than NASA's, we'll take that. So it is must be as good as or better than the NASA standard. And, and we took two years, at least two years, to go through every single standard that they would have to comply with. And we think we're in good shape. The reason companies put so much of their own cash into commercial cargo was because they saw that there was a definite return on investment and it was going to come immediately. SpaceX, uh, if you look at their manifest, the majority of their manifest is not NASA. And it's not the it's not the government. It is commercial satellite uh, deployment, and they've already flown a, a satellite, a commercial satellite, to geosynchronous orbit. That's where the money is. It, it's not with the government, and they know that. And so it was easy for them to put their money into that. And we've got to have a, a, a thriving, viable low Earth orbit infrastructure that has not just the International Space Station, but stations and modules from other countries. But most importantly stations and modules from commercial ventures, whether it's pharmaceuticals, materials processing, people that want to assemble rockets on orbit because they want to get away from the gravity well of Earth. And You know, one of these days we're going to have what we fly back and forth to Mars or to other places is never coming back to Earth. It's just, it's just, it, it, it won't work. If you've got to come back and land on the planet, what you want to be able to do is use SpaceX or Orbital or Boeing or somebody to fly your astronauts to a, a station. Uh, you know, think about going from the in, I don't, in DC. If I want to go to the airport, if I want to go to BWI, I go to Union Station, get on the train, go to BWI. Uh, I drive my car up there. So think about it this way. If I want an astronaut to go to Mars in the future, I'm going to put them in my car that I'm going to lease from somebody and we're going to fly them to a station, maybe the International Space Station, and then they're going to get them in a vehicle that's going back and forth to Mars that never comes back into the gravity well of Earth, and that's the way they're going to go. Much cheaper, much more efficient. Uh, it stays out there until it, until it dies, and then we replace it with another one. That's the, that's the vision for the future. And I think, you know, when Dan talked about, uh, you know, what was said earlier, I forgot who you said said it. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Um, we can think about the past and dwell on it uh, and pat ourselves on the back or we can, we can dream about the future. And I, the reason I love coming to campus, these kids aren't looking back. They are not. If, if, you're, if you're looking back, they're going to leave us behind.